Have you ever heard of a great white shark swimming in a pond? This is Kevin McMurray with TrackingSharks.com, and today we're looking at a white shark that got stuck in a lagoon. Our shark pond story starts all the way back in September of 2004. Tuck Haishi, his girlfriend, and a friend, Drew Kalella, were in search of false albacore when they approached a private island owned by the Forbes family. The group headed to the small lagoon off Nashwoon Island, approaching a small bridge with eight people standing on it. It was odd to see that many people on the bridge during the middle of the day, and the group assumed that they were just rich people having a cocktail party. Tuck saw birds diving in the water on the other side of the bridge and assumed they were after the same fish he was looking for. He and his friends approached the bridge in the 16-foot skiff. One guy was hanging a fishing line over the bridge, ostensibly to discourage me from going through, he told the Cape Cod Wave in 2014. The line didn't stop Tuck, and the bridge angler moved the fishing line without saying a word as the skiff slid under the bridge. After making it to the other side of the bridge, Tuck spotted a four-foot fin popping out above the water. His first thought was a large basking shark was swimming around. As he headed toward the fish, his brain struggled to piece together what he was seeing. Quote, I thought it was two sharks. The fins were seven, eight feet apart. I was looking at a dorsal fin almost three feet tall and a tail fin almost four feet long. I was seeing it thrash in the shallows. And you could tell it was one fish. And you could also tell it had some link to it. End quote. As he moved his skiff closer to the fish, he guessed it was a white shark a white shark nearly as long as his 16-foot boat. Just like in the movie Jaws, the shark swam right toward the side of the boat and just before smashing into it, descended underneath and popped up on the other side. No one in the boat was scared. Instead, they were awestruck and curious as to what species of shark it actually was. At the time, the thought of seeing a great white shark in person was a true rarity. After several hours, the crew went home, and they all started calling friends telling them about the day's experience. Tuck called several people, one of whom explained how to identify a white shark compared to a basking shark. The news confirmed what Tuck already knew. It was a great white shark in the pond. He then got in touch with videographer Adam Lazarus to see if he wanted to go out the next day and film the shark. Tuck, Lazarus, and Coella met at 5 a.m. the next day. Lazarus wanted to film the shark, while Tuck wanted to catch it. According to Tuck, he really had no plan on catching the shark and said he knew that he couldn't land the massive fish. However, Lazarus said his friend absolutely planned on landing the fish and was going to donate the meat to feed the homeless. The federal government protected white sharks in 1997 which explains the difference in the recollections. As they approached the area where the shark was spotted the day before, Lazarus was enjoying the view as his boatmates were scouring the water looking for the shark. Then the mood quickly changed in the boat. They both are saying, there it is. I'm looking through my camera. I'm also trying to look at real life. It's not the same as looking through a camera. All of a sudden, maybe 50 yards away, comes up a really big fin. It takes my breath away. The fins were so big, and there was such a length of distance between them. My heart skips a beat. This is exactly what I've been scared of. I'm like, fuck. I start to hear it. It's just pushing water out of the way. I started to film this, and I look, Lazarus said, adding, if I'm going to die, I don't want to be looking through a viewfinder. In another Jaws moment, the shark swam straight toward the boat, and then submerged just before hitting it. Lazarus said it was the scariest moment of his life, proclaiming the shark was as big, if not bigger, than the boat. He said, It made me feel small out there bobbing up and down like an idiot. Lazarus said he could tell that Tuck wanted to hook the shark, and he wanted no part of it, insisting that he be dropped off on a rock so that he could be out of harm's way. As they dropped off Lazarus, Another onlooker standing on the rocks took his seat on the boat, and they headed into the water as Lazarus filmed from a rock. Tuck cast his line, and after several tries, he eventually hooked the shark. Unfortunately, the hook caught the shark's fin. 
Accounts vary, but the shark was hooked anywhere from 5 to 15 minutes. I look back on it now, said Coella, knowing we only had about 6 inches of clearance between the edge of his boat and the waterline. What were we thinking? We were out there taunting a great white shark, and we lived to tell about it. Earlier that same morning, Greg Skomel of the Massachusetts Marine Fisheries Division was loading up his boat. He'd received a call the previous day about the supposed white shark being spotted, and at first thought it was just another fishtail. Again, great white sharks were a rare sighting. At the time, the state of the white shark's population was unknown, and the only white sharks Skomel would see were dead. The sharks were unfortunate bycatch retrieved after becoming tangled in fishermen's nets. Skomo boated out to Falmarth Harbor, where he met up with a friend who had a low draft boat that could navigate the shallow salt pond waters. He brought fishing gear in case there was no shark so the day wouldn't be completely wasted. Upon arriving to the scene, Skomo's eyes dilated. I knew immediately it was a great white shark, he recalled. I was almost in shock a great white shark in this little lagoon. Greg was able to obtain a GPS tag and pin it on the shark's dorsal fin, making it the first GPS tag shark in the eastern United States. He had rushed to get the tag thinking the shark would exit the pond at any moment. Each high tide and full moon brought hope that the shark would head out. The news of the shark spread quickly, and before long, people were everywhere trying to catch a glimpse of the massive fish swimming in the salt pond. Some curiosity seekers were approaching the area in dinghies and kayaks, far smaller than the shark. Charter boat companies began ferrying hundreds of paying customers to see the shark, charging $100 a trip to $100 an hour to see the shark. Aerosmith guitarist Joe Perry chartered a boat with his family to witness the spectacle, along with visitors coming all the way from Canada. Scoville knew this was going to get worse and with a call to the State Game Commission, the state quickly passed a regulation to protect the 13-foot shark. Officials enforced a control zone to keep people away from the shark and placed signs around the area warning people not to harass the fish. The story of the shark spread across the globe, and everyone involved was inundated with calls from the media. People were so enthralled with the story that they started calling the shark Gretel. Thirteen days later, Gretel was still in the pond, and Skolmo was at a loss for how to get it out of the tiny pond. The stress was palatable, and Greg was suffering from sleepless nights and threats from people demanding the shark be saved. Skolmo was all for saving the shark. The question was how. How do you make a big shark leave a tiny pond? Fishing lines were immediately ruled out. Along with lassoing the tail, the last resort would be to sedate the shark, which could be fatal for it. Bait bags full of fish burly didn't work either. The shark just would not go for it and aimlessly circled the pond. Thankfully, Daniel McCurran, assistant director of the Division of Fisheries, came up with an idea of using large fishing nets called weirs. The fishing weir consisted of nets moved by several different boaters. As the shark hit the net, it would just bounce off. As the shark neared the exit, the team used pumps to spray water at the shark, corralling it toward the exit. The water jets and nets worked, and the shark finally slipped across some shallow rocks and off to freedom, for a moment. The shark went around the island and into the shallow Lackey's Bay. Back to the pumps. The team used the water pumps to guide the shark back out to sea, and there were high fives all the way around. Unfortunately for Skomel and the rest of the scientists interested in the tracking data, the tag popped off 45 minutes after the shark left. Everyone involved slept a little easier, knowing they had helped rescue the salt pond shark. The event played such a part in Skomel's life that he actually asked his wife to marry him in the same location. And that is the story of the white shark stuck in a pond, but it's not the first. In 1954, another white shark was caught in a salt pond two miles away. Unfortunately, it was killed. Gretel's salvation shows how much people's perceptions of white sharks have changed in the last 50 years. What would you do if you ran across a white shark in a salt pond? Let us know in the comments. If you like this video, give us a thumbs up and subscribe. Comment what you'd like us to cover next. Support us at patreon.com slash tracking sharks. Give us a super thanks. 
Join us on Facebook, Twitter, at Tracking Sharks, and visit us online at trackingsharks.com. Thank you, and as always, stay safe and get wet soon.